following program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. It's time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market updates and trading strategies. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. Break it down. It's time to hit the option block. With your host, Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com. And co-hosts, Mike Tussaw from KnowYourOptionsInc.com and Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com. The Option Block is brought to you by Options Express. Don't spend time worrying about your broker. At Options Express, security, stability, and account protection are the most important responsibilities to our customers. Secure account access, enhanced financial protection, entrusted with over $7 billion in customer assets, established financial stability. Options Express lets you trade with confidence. Stocks, options, and futures, all in one account. Trade with a specialist. Visit optionsexpress.com slash OX radio to open your free account. Options Express is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Option Block. You know what time it is. That rockin' tune means it is time once again to take your bi-weekly dive into the world of options. My name is Mark Longo from the OptionsInsider.com, as well as from a wee little thing that we around here like to call the old Options Insider Radio Network. I will be your tour guide on this trip through the nether regions of the options realm, as you'll see when we start talking about the odd block in a little bit. A lot of interesting stuff going on today. Some interesting action in the old market. Some actual stuff to talk about today, which is nice. And joining me to talk about all this fun stuff, starting off beaming and all the way from the great state of Maine. He's done doing his lumberjack impersonation, chopping down trees and fishing and all that fun wilderness stuff. Now he's ready to be back on the old all-star panel. You know him, you love him as the rock lobster. He is Andrew Giovinazzi from OptionPit.com. Mr. Andrew, welcome back to the show, sir. I, I, I'm i thrilled and happy to be here. You, you, I thought you were going to call me the option blockhead for a minute. You got stuck between metaphors. I was stuck. I was mixing my metaphors there, wasn't I? <laughs> yes. You were, you, were, you were but being minced up. You were wood chipping metaphors. <laughs> if, I could, if I could mince another one. Speaking of wood chips, unfortunately, we are still waiting for that fellow who loves the wood chips so much, good old Uncle Mike Tussaw. But rest assured, listeners, we are joined by our other able companion, the man holding down the hot seat from the Options Express World HQ here in Chicago, back from his sunny, scenic high holiday vacation and ready to block some options. He is none other than the Viceroy himself, Mr. Alex Jacobson from Options Express. Alex, welcome back to the show, sir. Good to be back, Mark. Uh, interesting show you guys did last Thursday. Uh, listened to it over the weekend. Uh, clearly, the denominator fell in many ways. <laughs> I won't say who, but a certain person, whenever he comes on the show, tends to drag it in all sorts of weird places, uh, as you saw last episode. But it's kind of fun nonetheless. But we certainly did miss you on the program, on the old panel, Alex. It's good to have you back. And with you in tow, it's time to kick off. This here show with the trading block. The trading block. All right, and welcome to the trading block. This is, of course, the portion of the show where we break down the day's worth of activity and surprise, surprise, there actually was some today, which is quite nice. We've had some. Uh, some quiet days of late, some interesting movements in volatility and whatnot, but the underlyings have been relatively relatively quiet for the most part. People have been trying to figure out what's been going on out there in the broad, broad spectrum of the marketplace. And today it seems like all of those concerns you may have had about Syria and about the market and everything else 
It's all gone because the market was rally ho mode today. All of them, my entire screen, except for gold, <laughs> was red. Looks like today. I think a couple others uh, may have. Uh, Verizon was also down. That's about it. Not too much red on my screen today. A sea of green. Most of the major indices up one percent or even more. S and P closing up exactly one percent to sixteen seventy one. Dow a little bit of a laggard, up almost one percent to uh, fifteen sixty three. 15.063, I should say. And then the NASDAQ up 1.3% to 37.06 on the day. VIX Cash selling off commensurately down about a third of a point. Not exactly the vol crushing some people might have expected. Some of that may be the weekend coming in. Some of that may be people still a little bit on the fence about what's going on overseas. What's your take on that, Andrew? What do you think with uh, VIX Cash today? Did it, uh, did it meet your expectations, exceed, underperform? Uh, wow. Multiple choice question. I don't know if I can deal with that. <laughs> um, Making it easier for you. VIX, I, I appreciate you setting me up like that. Uh, VIX cash. Um, one thing in, in, at the beginning of the day, there was like, no, there's no vol pop. So there's no weekend effect. So, uh, I don't know if we touched on this uh, Monday. I, I'm still trying to recover from the Thursday show, the aftershocks of the Thursday show. And I wasn't even on it, but <laughs> the reverberations are felt far and wide. <laughs> still coming through. But uh, we didn't – because they kept the volatility in this weekend uh, because of a potential strike or whatever, we never had the weekend effect. VIX actually rallied a little toward the end of today, spent most of the day falling. Um, and, I, I, you know, I, I wrote a little blog on Friday like, you know, I probably one to two points in VIX is uh, this Syria thing. And – we did see the vol futures back off a little bit, but I think right toward the close, we're going to keep getting this little bid in volatility just in case something happens. Um, so, but did it, I think we're going to stay kind of in this just higher plane of volatility for a while until there's a resolution there. Real simple. So it wasn't too much of a surprise. Yeah. Me. You know, they beat the drum so hard over the past couple of weeks and then it kind of petered out a little bit as all the rest of the international community kind of wringed their hands collectively and uh, hemmed and hawed about what to do. And then uh, that seemed to really uh, stymie the market a little bit. And we saw some good news coming out of the marketplace, including today, where a lot of today's rally seem really to be stemmed, or should I say, a lot of today's rally really seemed to be driven by the good news coming out of China, which is funny because a few months back it was China weighing on the market. Yep, China's dead. <laughs> I know. China, never going to make a dime again. <laughs> I know. It's, it's such a – market is the most fickle beast on the planet. Yeah. China's done. All stocks up size. Exactly. China's <laughs> done. It's the end of the dragon. All these stories we've been hearing, it's garbage. It's all nonsense. It's all manufactured by the state. The thing's done. A few months later, oh, look at these export numbers. It's oh. back. Oh, wait a minute. Who's buying those? Oh. oh, must be the Europeans. You know, it's all. <laughs> you know, you can't blame people when they kind of throw their hands up in the air and say, really? What the hell? And uh, that's uh, certainly part of the narrative today where these stories come out and you just kind of scratch your head and say, really? <laughs> this is this is what we're all concerned about today. That's and why a long time ago, I really stopped trying to weigh in on what was driving the macro events, you know, because it's 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 so much fluff and so much nonsense. I've told this joke many times on the show before. I think I'll repeat it again. When I first walked on the floor of the SIBO, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, straight out of college, looking at straight out of my derivatives courses, looking to become this great big trader. And I was like, oh, we're up today. What's moving? Whatever the name was, IBM or Intel or whatever. Or, you know, what's, was it an analyst upgrade? Or was it this? And all the old-timers would say, more buyers than sellers, kid. And I thought they were being jerks. And, and then uh, right. and, <laughs> until I spent some time on the floor and I realized, you know what? They're right. <laughs> that really is the answer. And uh, so uh, all this hemming and hawing about what is causing this, these macro movements. Uh, really kind of just makes me chuckle quite often. I like to bring it up on the show every now and then just to remind people of where we come from here on the show. But yeah, for the most part, more buyers and sellers seem to be seem to be the norm today. Speaking of buyers and sellers, what were people buying and selling over there in OX land today, Mr. Jacobson? What caught your eye? Don't spoil all of the Express block for us, but give us a little tease, a little taste of what's coming up. Apple and Lulu. And, and Lulu has been a name that's been, I don't want to say dormant, but with earnings this week, it's uh, lighting up the tape again here. Lulu earnings must be a, a holiday over there at the OX HQ because for a long time, Lulu was lighting up your tape. Lulu was a huge OX component of your ADV, and it seemed to drop off a little bit. Maybe the post uh, the post sheer pants fiasco did them in for a little bit. 
Yeah, I get I get numbers uh, about a month delayed, so I just got our July numbers, and uh, Lulu wasn't even on the radar screen, and uh, we, I'm I'm not you know this is not a hard number, but we have done we may have done more Lulu today uh, than we did in the entire month of July, and with the Apple announcement tomorrow, Apple has become. Uh, kind of the darling of the industry. I mean, in the last few months, it's been Apple or Tesla. And Tesla was, uh, at least at the things I look at, the only really down uh, name today. And it was down right out of the box. And often when you're down right out of the box, that means it's a quiet day in terms of, uh, of volume uh, for most of the day. And then we get what I'll call our fundamental put sellers that come in late in the day and say it's kind of tr it's contra trend of the day it's got a little pop in the vol when it went down and we get some fundamental put sellers and that's pretty much what the what the day was like today speaking about apple there alex of course it is the big event tomorrow i, I say big event kind of with a little bit of quotes around it because this used to be the big driver the big movement when apple would have their annual iphone event it was the news all the tech, and even a lot of the mainstream people would really tune into. It was the big driver for the stock. It was a big deal. Now we see, you know, Android events every couple of weeks, it seems like. New handsets coming out on that side of the fence. New stuff from other players, Windows Phone and whatnot. The pace of that has so exceeded the Apple pace with their one phone a year, one handset a year, that it really almost seems to have out, outshone that a little bit now. I, I, I don't know. I don't want to say the, the bloom is off the rose. Everyone has already said that a million times. But it certainly seems like there are less eyes tuning in to the iPhone announcement this year. Perhaps it's just me. Uh, but, you know, it is one of these re evolutionary as opposed to revolutionary handset designs. Uh, it doesn't seem, I'm looking at the stock here today, I mean, it closed up 1.5%, so it certainly wasn't a light day. But, you know, these are all these, these, this is what we see in Apple all the time, the whole buy the rumor, sell the fact. People getting really fired up going into the handset, it gets announced. Uh, the analysts say it's not going to be what everyone thought it was going to be, and then the stock gets crushed. And, of course, people, people come and buy it anyway. People still come in. They're on the two-year cycle. They love their iPhone. They want to get the new iPhone. This is the new one. They get their 5S or 5C or whatever they're calling it this year. And it seems to be like relatively like clockwork for them now. And that's kind of the new business. People are expecting these great revolutionary, world-changing, earth-shattering projects coming out of Apple, that probably isn't the case much anymore. They're going to be evolutionary products that people like. They're seeing what's going on out there in, in Android land, and they want to play too, maybe a little bit bigger screen, uh, some other cool stuff, and that's kind of about it. App Andrew, is that kind of your take as well? Are you, are your, let me ask you this, maybe a better metric for our listeners. All your mentees, all your clients over there at Option Pit, are they still as Apple gung-ho? Are they still as into looking for strategies on Apple? Have they kind of, have they kind well, of come off that a little bit? Selectives. You know, I, the I, you know, implied volatility, IV30, was about as high today as it was going into an, an earnings announcement. IV30 is about the same as it was in the last announcement, actually. So from people buying options, it's kind of rich, uh, to be honest. Uh, it's the highest IV30 we've had in since April. It's actually topped. It was above the IV30 we had on the last release when just nobody thought Apple, nobody cared. So we were looking for ways. Uh, it was it basically you want to sell some juice. Uh, maybe it was all kind of costly to sort of put it on, so we ended up not doing anything. Um, but. I think the bigger news is is if this uh, their growth in China has been priced in. I'm still trying to figure that out if they can start selling iPhones in China um, in, to the to the biggest uh, providers. I, so I'm from looking, looking growth at growth point of view. That's a big deal. Yeah. I, are they going to announce anything? Who knows, right? But they're they're certainly they got the vol bid up this time, like there was going to be a surprise announcement. So we. You know, I like selling vol, but um, I don't know if this was. Anyway, I'll just say we just we backed away from it uh, for the most part. Uh, but I, I think you could see some kind of move out of Apple after this announcement. But the vol will come in. No question about it. Yeah, you kind of you know, get a little bit of that earnings boost to it. But you're right. It has moved quite a bit after these announcements of late, whether it's disappointing or whatnot. And people seem to be uh, lining up for that trade yet again. Go ahead, Mr. Alex. Yeah, I think, first of all, you've had two stealth rallies here. One has been Apple, the other has been Facebook. But I think the landscape has changed 
uh, for both of those companies because uh, of customers embracing the weeklies. I mean, you, you look at what goes on up here and, and you know, I spend part of the day kind of with one ear listening to the trading desk and, and that's not indicative of all the paper that flows through OX on a given day. But, but last week, I, I was only here one day last week and uh, there was lots of premium selling going on in the, in the weeklies and, and uh, one day into this week, it's been premium buying. And it, it seems the paper in Apple, at least the, the, the paper I hear, and again, let me caveat that, that's, that's not all the paper. It, it's almost become a swing trade in the sense that last week everybody was selling, but they clearly wanted to be out before tomorrow. This week it's been buying, even with the Volpop. When it took out 400, you know, and everybody wrote it off, there were folks up here, especially some of the, the those of us that have been around a while, you know, walking around saying, eh, as soon as they write it off, uh, buy the out of the money calls. And, and uh, with the benefit of hindsight, that was the trade. But I think weeklies are changing the whole character of uh, how the, the options market is being employed by investors. And, and I think especially in the weekly area, you know, you, you don't have – I only sell premium. You have fun, some folks that say, you know, I'm going to sell premium two or three weeks out of the month, but one week out of that month, I'm going to own some premium. And it might be expiration week. It might be, you know, quote unquote, some event week. Um, but, you know, there was premium buying in the expectation of this event. And, and you know, listening in on some of this, you, you hear customers who are saying things like, you know, if it's an exciting announcement tomorrow, that's a 60 or 70 or $80 move in the stock. And, you know, you kind of wrinkle your nose and say, if they're right, I'm going to look like a moron on Wednesday. But the, 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 the character of trading has changed a lot with weeklies. You know, I, I like that's a good point. And maybe we need to update the old 1.5 trade that used to be the old OEX to SPX trade maybe now it's the the weekly short to buy trade where you five weeks you're short and then one week you want to buy some premium because it looks kind of good if something's maybe happening so maybe that's the new characteristic of the active there's retail also trader. more time spread opportunities for people yeah. to get long for little prices you know we do a lot of the like weekly time spreads and stuff from uh you know for ways to basically sell some juice as well put, create some data but you know, having a, having the, the weekly option choices, it's if you're spend a little more time and be selective, um, there are you know a lot of ways to kind of have your cake and eat it too with some of these uh, short duration time spread. Yeah, I got for the short duration side of it. Um, I'm totally a different risk manager now than I was a a year ago, just because of the fact that with the new weeklies in the way they are with the multiple week options, it's totally changed the landscape of a lot of different things. There he is, the dulcet tones of one Uncle Mike Tussaud, joining us as if by magic. It's as if you knew that we were discussing that fruit company and you couldn't let it go without adding your two cents, sir. Like a little birdie told you <laughs> exactly. to get on Skype. Those traitorous, <laughs> traitorous birdies ratting us out again. Welcome to the show, Uncle Mike. And what's your take? What are you doing? What are you prepping for ahead of the big announcement tomorrow? Well, you just I'm still long Apple, long puts, and then... Um, the credit spread that I've been putting on to finance the long puts, I'm at the 484.70 level for this week as opposed to the 490.480 level. Um, so going into this week, what's benefited me is, yeah, with the vol bid up the way it was, is I could put the credit spread out a little bit further than normal. And uh, if we do have a 60 or 70 point move tomorrow, then I'll take the phone calls with clients to complaining about why are, we, why are we hedged Apple when Apple's obviously going up. Very used to such phone calls, and uh, such is life. Uh, uh, the rough life of Uncle Mike Tussaud. Stock rallies, why are you wasting money on hedging? Uh, stock drops, though, you're a genius, so it's not bad. There are worse things. <laughs> yeah, could be worse. I know you, Uncle Mike. You're, you're an Apple devotee, but you're really lining up for that new big smartwatch from Samsung. I, I saw you. I saw your, you salivating at the notion of having that nice computer with a camera strapped to your wrist. 
I don't know what what a man could want more with a computer strapped to his wrist like that. It reminds me of like back when back in the 80s when the, those calculator watches first came out. Those are the coolest things. And now with all the things that I can I can only imagine what this iWatch is going to do. Or maybe that are you going to switch to Android and have one of those big seven inch phones <laughs> plastered to your face when you're making a phone call. <laughs> That's what we need. There you go. A smart watch and a big computer phone on your head and you're all set. You're ready for the future. There you go. <laughs> of course, there were some other news uh, out in the land. Of course, you like you like to watch your your medals. I was surprised, uh, maybe you were surprised as well, Uncle Mike, at how how tepid the response in the precious medals, particularly gold, was today. It was relatively unched on the day. Did that surprise you as well? It did. You know, I thought with the announcement with China doing what they did, I figured that uh, not so much gold. I was figuring we'd have more of a move in silver, but it really was quite boring. Yeah, I mean, you already have your position on for Apple. Your gold and, app and silver didn't really do anything. Must have been a very high BBI day for you. I don't even know what to do with myself on days <laughs> such as today. Good thing you took up knitting again. It's a good hobby for you. <laughs> I had to roll up a call on my SPY spread, but other than that, kind of a dull day. You know, like Rosie Greer. Didn't he? Didn't Rosie Greer knit or something? Back in the day, Maybe. Rosie Greer. He was a knitter. <laughs> he, he kicked off the knitting trend, and now all these uh, hipster ladies in Brooklyn do. It's all because of Rosie Greer, huh? Is that what you're saying? Yes, yeah, something like that, exactly. <laughs> Everyone knows hipsters always I worship be, at the I altar of Rosie I might be dating Greer. myself, I just realized. But, a wee bit, you know. a wee bit, sir. We won't hold it against you. Speaking of dating ourselves here on the show, it wasn't that long ago when we were just lambasting uh, Mr. Grigas for bu having the temerity to buy Groupon at 5. Uh, Groupon uh, passing the 11 handle today, $11.10. thing continues to rally. Uh, they announced today they're acquiring someone, a travel app, Blink. I guess this newfound uh, burst in their stock makes them think they have some, some currency to start spending again and acquiring things. Uh, and how about you guys over there at, at Option Pit, Andrew? Has there been much resurgence of interest out there in Groupon? Um, I know you were heavy you know, on the risk of personal Zynga. You know Mark hates Groupon, and I just I care less about it. Um, but he, he has a personal vendetta against the companies. <laughs> how about Groupon as the stealth Zynga, the surrogate for Zynga? How's that it, work? It is. It is. And I'm, I'm finally back to even on my Zynga trade. <laughs> I'm not going to make any more comments. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to just say, all right, I was not very smart, but we'll we'll try to uh, soldier on. That can be the uh, book. You know, who knows with Groupon? I, who knows? You know? Sure, it can make money. They got rid of that that CEO guy, and that guy took his hundred million bucks, and he can go sulking, you know, the Bahamas somewhere. Yeah, he did all right. He's not too he's not too upset. Uh, yeah, they continue to exist. They continue to thrive. Apparently, all the encroaching com competition in that local sales space uh, hasn't really eroded them. At least, perhaps not as much as everyone thought. So they're continuing to rally, and with this rally, acquiring a travel app of all things. So kind of interesting. Kind of reminds me. A little bit of Zynga, that's why I joked about them when they had that burst after the IPO and they were flush with cash. They were suddenly gobbling up apps that imploded in their face. Uh, hopefully Groupon is not following suit. One last little thing just to mention. You may have seen some of the news on it recently. Uh, happened on Friday. Uh, kind of a, one of those surprise slash duh moments when you see headlines like Citibank is uh, closing their their desks on the Board of Trade. So all their futures traders over on the Board of Trade are now moving upstairs. It was a big headline we saw on Friday, and it kind of made me just scratch my chin and say, really? I thought, I'm surprised they still had them. <laughs> I ran into a, a city guy on Friday night at an event, and he said, did you see we're closing all of our stuff? And I kind of had to say, wow, really? You guys are still down there, still active in the old grains and treasury pits, apparently. Well, apparently now they're all moving upstairs. So it's kind of just one of these headlines that kind of, to me, says, duh, this is the evolution of where things are going. And uh, this surprises you. And if you're one of these guys who got laid off, of course, that's unfortunate. If you're still a runner for city at this point, and you're not looking down the road a little bit to say, maybe my job may not be around much longer, uh, then perhaps you need to uh, look elsewhere. But uh, still interesting stuff to see some of these big desks closing out their futures presences or at least migrating them upstairs so they can do a lot more on Globex and other things like that. I think that's kind of par for the course. I wouldn't be surprised if you don't see more of those headlines down the road. Anything else you guys want to hit on before we roll on into the odd block? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Grigas moved this weekend. I wonder if that new swimming pool says Groupon on the bottom of it. <laughs> Didn't he like Tesla too? Uh, he, were, he and I were the puts. We, we were selling puts back around 20 on Tesla. That seemed like a genius trade now. <laughs> yeah. he, he did actually move this weekend, so I'll, I'll have to give him some grief if the square footage went up. He's got that new mansion out there in the burbs, courtesy of Groupon. Could be. Hey. I, for his sake, I, 
I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and with the thought of Groupon McMansions swirling in our heads, we're going to keep on rolling right on into the Odd Block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by theoptionsinsider.com. It's time for the Odd Block. everybody you know what time it is it's time to don your fedora and join us over here on the old odd block this is where of course we dive into the somewhat more dubious side of the old options biz going to kick things off with an interesting trade here in xhb this is the of course the spider s p home builders etf they close today literally 30 bucks or 29.99 uh, up about three and a half percent, excuse me, or about a dollar on the day, and it was a pretty active day for good old XHB. It's the name that's doing around 17,000 contracts a day, lighting up the tape with nearly 55,000 today. A lot of it coming in this very, very funky spread. We saw the SEPOC 30 call spread going up for 50 cents, roughly 49 cents, doing it two by one, 20,000 by 10,000 so a total of 30,000 of those 54,000 contracts or roughly 2x this name's ADV going up in one very sizable spread just looking here at the uh, at the SEP the SEP open interest is 76,000 contracts and only 9,000 on the OC so it looks like uh, given up this way that this trade went up and the way that it was marked as a spread it looks like perhaps this guy was buying to close some of that SEP, given there's so much open interest out there in SEP, and perhaps saying, well, I'm not perhaps done yet with XHB. I've made so much money. Why not dive in again with another 10,000 contracts and put a little bit more money on the table? Was that your take as well, Senior Rock Lobster? He was. It was weird. I thought he was closing a gain in SEP on the rally today and then loading up and buying more OC with his money. Um, that's how I, that's how I read that. Cause when um, you hit double zero on the old roulette wheel, nothing sweeter than putting it right back on there again. And that's, that's kind of how I see the trade. Cause one look closed, the ox were clearly opening, you know, he, he could certainly have said, I'm going to sell the SEP two by one and try to finance my entire ox position and see what happens. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, unless he read like some, he didn't read some gamma book. He held the book upside down. <laughs> he might have some trouble with that trade. <laughs> um, so I'm going to assume that it's closing in SEP and buying October. Yeah, you know, we've seen people being a little bit more bullish on the home building sector in general. This it's clearly worked out for this guy. Decided to take a little bit of money off the table and put a little bit back to work for him, thinking perhaps the trend is still his friend out there in good old XHB. We'll keep an eye on this one. See if this guy, well, he's already made his money, so he's probably happy. But Yeah, I mean, it was definitely clinking around around just the low 28 handle. Uh, he probably picked these calls up for a dime, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, there are definitely worse trades. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think he's, uh, <laughs> seems like it's working for him, so I'm not. <laughs> Can't mock him too badly. <laughs> he goes home with some cash under his pillow, and he could sleep well at night. And he might be buying the house next to Grigas, yes. the house that Groupon <laughs> He has the McMansion next to the Grigas uh, Groupon pool uh, out there in uh, in one of the suburbs, wherever Mr. Grigas hangs his hat. To bring him back on the show so we can detail all of his what he's done with all of his Groupon windfall. He must work exactly. at OX now just for charity. He just likes to do it so much. And he just, you know what, he likes the customer interaction. Yes, and he likes exactly. the Alex on the, <laughs> for the health insurance. I am. He's, he's here for the health insurance. <laughs> Oh, right. Obamacare changes everything. There we go. There we go. It goes yeah. back to politics. Always back to politics with you, <laughs> Mr. Jacobson. All right. Next up, we have the good old VIX. I've never heard of this one. Vikes. Is that how you pronounce that? Uh, uh, I think, yeah, Vikes is the right Vikes. way. This is the, right this way. is the name, the, the ETF that tracks Viking investments. Is that what it is? All right. <laughs> of course, we are talking about the VIX, the CBOE Volatility Index. Closing today, VIX Cash 1563, as we discussed at the top of the show, down about a quarter of a point or so. We discussed that earlier in the show. No surprises there. 
What was interesting, it looks like some pretty sizable activity going up in the VIX SEP 14s. These are, of course, the front month SEP 14 puts, I should add. Uh, big block going up this morning of uh, for about a nickel, about 6,000 contracts. And then towards the end of the day, a total of nearly 32,000 uh, went up on there. Of course, on a on a, just a ton of open interest, 281,000 contracts. So it looks like a block of this uh, could be closing, even though you think uh, it was lifting the offer. What's your take there, Mr. Andrew? Uh, yeah, chasing know, it for closing. I, I, I definitely, I, you know, I want to look at the open interest numbers tomorrow. I, either way, if you're short the SEP 14 puts, um, you know, I, I don't think you're a couple days ago, you weren't too worried. Now all of a sudden you're like, well, you know, if the Syria thing really gets fixed, everybody's going to sit here and look at the volatility trading where we are. And we're, is it really going to stay up there? So like, well, maybe I'll close some of these SEP 14 puts. So, uh, this morning they opened up just add a nickel for all you wanted, and by the end of the day they were nickel bits. So you, yeah, that has at all least the hallmarks of closing. Taking a cheap shot or closing the fact that you know these are little puts that could probably be even if vol implodes. Realistically, these puts probably go to twenty five cents tops. Um, I mean, where are we going to go? Are we really going to go too far below uh, um, uh, fourteen bef prior to the you know the FOMC nonsense. You know, maybe 13 and three quarters tops. Um, so it's it, just from the timing of the puts, I, it would be very hard for them to get worth more than a quarter. But, you know, you pay a nickel for them, you have a shot maybe to sell them for 10, 15 cents higher. So I think maybe that's what some people are doing. But if I was short them, I would close them. <laughs> I mean, how much more money are you going to make? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you I don't know if you've known, you know this, Andrew, but China is back. So you don't want to be short a ton of the SEP 14 puts right now. I, China's exactly. clearly back. <laughs> We're going to 12, back. baby. And you know what's funny? That FXI has actually been a nice trading uh, instrument. It's one of those few like ETF indexes that actually just rips around all over the place. It's been up. Oh, I don't want to say it, but you could buy premium in there and make money probably for the last four weeks. <laughs> So <laughs> there you go. Buying juice. Gaps. You got to love, you got to love products that gap, you know, when you own juice. Yeah. And if you are short a, a ton of those SEP 14 puts and you're not closing them out now, then uh, you're probably kind of, kind of silly. This has all the hallmarks of someone chasing to close something out, uh, chasing, lifting that nickel offer till it's gone and then vacillating around a dime and trying to work some nickel bids and trying to get more closed. Cause any sane risk manager, I think at this point would be saying, Take those off the table, and that seems to be what's going on out there in the VIX. Moving on to some corporate action business, Smithfield Foods, ticker symbol SFD, closing up about a quarter of a point to 34.16. This is, of course, a name that's been in the headlines of late. This is a manufacturer of fresh meat and packaged meat products. But, of course, the big deal is that they were being potentially bought up by a Chinese conglomerate. There was a lot of questions over a Chinese firm owning a major pork producer in the U.S. and food safety and all that kind of stuff. Well, they got the sign off today, and it looks like Uncle Mike Tussaw was playing out here in uh, in Smithfield today because it might have been a size stupid going up. This is the name that's usually doing 4,000 contracts a day, doing a whopping 100,000 or just about today out there. So a lot of action lighting up the old tape here in Smithfield, including... Oh, over two thirds of that volume, 32,000 and nearly 40,000 going up on the OC 34s and OC 35s. Uh, the OC 34s in particular are having a ton of open interest, 77,000, uh, but also nothing really, only 10,000 open on the OC 35. So that's clearly opening. It looked like, based on how we wrote it up early in the day, it looked like it was a ratio, but now it looks like it could have just been buys on both. Oh, I'm sorry, sales, sells on both. Uh, a closing sell stupid perhaps or opening on the 35s uncle mike what were you doing out there he was yeah he was smoking he was smoking <laughs> some of the smithfield foods pork in his <laughs> backyard kettle <laughs> uh, yeah i guess somebody's what selling and then the oc 40 the 34 calls went bid 45 cent bid this this paper to me is confusing i i haven't seen what the deal price is but you know all of a sudden uh these calls are clearly trading higher than where they were uh, this morning. So, you know, I think somebody sold a bunch of contracts uh, possibly to unwind and then they went bid. Um, so it just, it just really, all I can say is it is odd paper. I don't understand, you know, the only thing I could see is they're just trying to make the, uh, 
uh, they whoever selling these things uh, as as opening basically thinks this stuff's going out worthless. I don't know how much money they made buying the 34. So it's just it's either marked wrong or something. It's just weird. Yeah, it is yeah. very weird. Certainly quite courageous to be blasting out 40,000 OC 35s when you're trading 3416 and you got some news hovering around out there. Uh, that's a wee bit, shall we say, risky. And I thought the deal price was a little higher than what we're trading here. I'm uh, looking. So that's what just it just it sounds very strange to me here um, on all that. So very, very odd paper. Since it's so that's odd. Better, odd block. Yes. Uh, aptly named odd block since it is so odd we will file that also in the to be watched category <clears throat> excuse me we're gonna close things out here in the old odd block with eme everyone's favorite eme uh, of course this is the iShares emerging markets index ticker symbol eem closing 41 dollars and about a nickel this is a name that usually does oh some some volume some paper <laughs> about 400,000 contracts a day doing about that same number today. So it wasn't a volume alert so much that caught our eyes is really just kind of a, a weird trade alert. Uh, looks like a, a three-way here, a three-legged spread. We saw the Nove 35-38 put spread. And then uh, the OC 37 puts coming in to finance the whole deal. This is a bit of a crazy one here. Andrew, why don't you walk our listeners through what really caught your eye about this one? Uh, one is um, the emerging markets. Actually, we've been talking about, you know, oh, China's dead. India's dead. They're all dead, 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 dead. Um, and EE uh, and the EEM, which is, I guess, a good proxy for those, has kind of been making a quiet comeback from the lows this year around the 37 handles trade. And I think it almost traded 41 today. And this is another this is another one where all the paper was marking buy, buy, buy all the on all all sides, buying the no puts. 35 and 38 puts, and then buying the 37 puts, just a bizarre paper. Uh, the only thing, that, the way it looked like to me is they were closing uh, the October uh, puts, as, according to the up, the October open interest was huge. Um, assuming, right, uh, that they're closing, tra taking 21,000 contracts out of the 89,000 open interest, but if that's the closing side of the transaction, then they're going out and buying more puts um, farther out. I mean, farther out of the money. So uh, it all I can say is, did they buy some stock now and buy puts? Uh, maybe trying to create a strangle or something? Really just, it's it just makes no sense to me whatsoever the way this trade went up. That's why I said um, today, the really weird <laughs> one in the old odd block uh, a lot of trades to kind of ponder and, and choke your chin and say, hmm, what really went up there? Of course, we'll know a little more tomorrow when we see those open interest numbers, and we can say definitively they did X or Y. I'm, right. not, I'm not seeing any stock going up here. It looks like it, it would be tied to those that would make it a, a stock trade. I have to dig yeah, a little just, bit further. Just strange paper. You know, speaking of strange paper, I should, before we close out the old odd block, let me just jump back to Smithfield for one second. We talked about them a while ago as being one of the few actual prosecutions or attempted prosecutions for insider trading using options. You remember back uh, a few months back, uh, there was a trader out of Thailand who jumped in ahead of this deal uh, when the takeover bid was announced for uh, Smithfield Foods, and he actually used options to do it. You very rarely see them being prosecuted on that. Well, it sounds like they stay settled with him on Friday uh, for using options ahead of the Smithfield takeover, and he's going to pay $5.2 million uh, to settle his civil charges. So there you go. We talked before about how it's so hard and there's so few prosecutions of insider trading using options despite all of his unusual activity we highlight here's one that actually happened and they got him overseas as well so there you go there is some uh, perhaps some changes afoot here in the old options market people starting to track down these things that are shall we say well timed at best and perhaps a little bit dubious at worst interesting stuff thank you andrew and of course now it's time to keep on rolling right on into the viceroy block aka the express block the Express Block, brought to you by Options Express. Options Express lets you trade where and when you want for every level of trading, from advanced charting, free daily trading ideas, and free educational resources. Options Express is the online broker for all traders. Best of all, Options Express allows you to trade stocks, options, and futures all in a single account on powerful yet easy to use trading platforms, including mobile devices. Visit OptionsExpress.com/oxradio for your free account. Options Express. 
Express is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. All right, that rocking tune means it is time to unleash the Viceroy upon you listeners. Mr. Alex, it's been a while since, you're back on, since you've been on the show, so I know you have a lot saved up for our listeners, particularly about that little name, a.k.a. Lulu. I know we joked about it at the top of the show, but that was a big driver for you guys over at OX. Seems like it's creeping back on onto the old radar now that earnings are coming up. So what caught your eye about Lulu and the other trades going up over there at OX today? Yeah, t- today, I mean, uh, we were up right out of the box. And uh, the interesting thing today, and I, I've made this comment on previous shows, I, I felt like today I worked for, you know, a, a Boston-based money manager. Um, when I listened to the desk today, um, it was everything. And it, and it wasn't only uh, the Apples and the Lulus today, but today was the the, the kind of day where people were trading Facebook, uh and again, that's that's come back from kind of the living dead. But it was also a day of all the traditional kind of second tier option names, um, Win and Cummings, and and you know kind of that second tier stuff that that we really don't talk a lot about. Um, bank stocks were active today, interestingly enough. Uh, lots of J.P. Morgan came up. Uh, repeatedly and an interesting name on the desk and this is out of the odd block one i think that we were talking about a month ago that has uh i think rallied about 40 percent but alcatel lucent uh which is cheap kind of the bank stock of 2009 uh was an active name um but today you know we're up out of the box and it was busy all day um and it was kind of a good day overall I'm sure it felt good to be back in the friendly confines of OX after your extended holiday, sir. Oh, uh, between time with my wife's family and being away, I miss this place. <laughs> I like that. And before we go, we should just remind our listeners, since it has been a while since we've talked about it, of course, Single Leg Walk Limit is live and active. They can get that on the website today. So if they haven't played around with it yet, get on over there to OX.com and try that out. I think it's going to really blow your mind when you actually start using it and seeing what it can do for you. I mean, it does what... So many big firms and big desks had their brokers do for them for years, which is work their orders. And it kind of works your order for you. And that's a fantastic thing. That's been one of the things that's been missing from the retail equation for so long. The ability to perhaps work your order while you're otherwise engaged, doing your day job, doing whatever it is you actually do for a living during the rest of the day when you're not watching your screens. Um, this certainly enables that. So that anything that enables more of that for retail, I think, is a good thing. People are loving it. Just loving it. All right. Thank you for that, Mr. Alex. And so now we're going to keep on rolling right on into my personal favorite part of the show, because it's your part of the show, the old mail block. Now it's time to empty the mailbag and see what our listeners have to say. It's the mail block. All right. You know what that theme means. It means it's time for you guys to take over the reins and let us know your questions and comments. If you want to join your friends here, you can, of course, Find us at theoptionsinsider.com, post a question on the show, find us on Twitter, twitter.com slash options, or on Facebook, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or the old-fashioned way, questions at theoptionsinsider.com. We're also looking at maybe bringing back the old call-in number. That might be kind of fun as well. Uh, First off, we're going to kick things off. We'll mix it up a little bit. How about a question here from Mr... Mr. Burgermeister, I like that name. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, he's writing in about what we talked about on the last show. He says, just to clarify from your last show, a back spread is net long units and a front spread is a traditional ratio, correct? And why such dumb names? <laughs> I love that. I think there's two parts to that question. This is, goes back, Andrew, you guys weren't on. Tusa, you weren't on last week either. Uh, none of you guys were on the show last week, actually. It was just me and Mark. Oh, actually, Tusa, uh, you were on last week. It was me and Mark and Tusa. And uh, we had a, someone write in, or we actually Mark was talking about front spreads. We talked about back spreads a lot on the show. And I said to him, since we're talking about front spreads, why don't you go ahead and define that for our listeners? I kind of thought that might be a confusing term, and sure enough, it was. Uh, just to, to yeah, just to short answer to your question here, yes, you are correct, uh, Mr. Burgermeister. Back spread, usually your traditional three by perhaps two. So you have some net long units uh, in your back pocket, and the front spread being the more traditional 
ratio type spread, one by two, one by three, so you're net short as you start rallying towards that short strike. As for the names, I, I couldn't begin to tell you. I think that's I think the terminology and options is one of the steepest impediments of people really coming in and appreciating and starting to learn these products. I've seen a lot of different firms try to get different ways around that, coming up with their own names, trying to just talk about what the strategy is. If you're bullish, it's this. But unfortunately, for whatever reason, we're saddled with these ridiculous names that are kind of counterintuitive, and uh, people have a hard time wrapping their heads around them. Mr. Andrew, anything you want to add to our friend here, Mr. Burgermeister, about the front spread or the back spreads? And those no, are those are two of your favorites. Short contracts, back spread your long contracts. That's that's it. That's the right way. Everything else is poppycock. Alex, since you've been around the block longer than any of us here, uh, do you have any guesses as to the the etymology of those names, front spread and back spread? I, I, I do, but it's a much longer show than this. I would just throw in one caveat, and uh, that is if you're unclear about a definition, uh, clarify. Because as uh, those of us who live in the options world have learned over the years, it's not uncommon to get – a, a question, especially true at seminars, and especially true when you're outside of the United States, and someone will use the term and uh, maybe not use the term the same way we use it uh, traditionally here. I used to do a lot of teaching in Australia for the for the OIC, and uh, what we call combos, they called something else. So just 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 be clear. Uh, especially if you're talking to a, a, a trading desk, um, spell out what you're doing. I'm buying one of these. I'm selling two of these. Uh, just be clear on the language because the language uh, can be confusing and uh, is often not uniform across borders. Yeah, that's certainly the case. And even amongst traders, we use different terms for the same thing, and it can be confusing talking to other traders. One guy will call it X, you'll call it Y. Uh, it, it is one of the problems with this uh, with this market, and unfortunately, no one's really cracked it yet uh, in terms of the terminology. Moving on, next question here. Uh, Mr. or perhaps Mrs. N. Sanchez, she says, I've heard a lot about volatility smiles, but from listening to your show, it sounds like the volatility skew actually has a downward slope to it. Does the volatility smile still exist, or is it limited to odd circumstances such as the, quote, Apple zealots that you've discussed on the show previously? I think I'm guilty of discussing hey, that. Hey, now, come on. <laughs> discussing that more than anyone. What does Mark call them? Fanboys. Yeah, yeah. All of the above. <laughs> zealots, fanboys, crazy people. It all applies. Uh, thank you so much for this tremendously informative program. Well, you're welcome, Mr. or Mrs. N. Sanchez. Uh, Mr. Andrew, want to take first crack at this one? Uh, yeah, most of what... What he's referring to is the skew pointing downward is like kind of standard equity, well, you know, equity or index skew, where basically the, the skew points up to where the fear is, if you think about that in a chart. So uh, commodity skew looks a lot different. It's actually a smile or kind of a funky parabola, just depending on the uh, instrument. Apple does kind of get parabolic because... Back in the good old days, there's just a lot of demand for calls, uh, pushing that that call side to a uh, basically to a positive skew. So you end up getting a smile on it. Um, if you look at e, something, let's say Google, Google actually can get slightly, um, uh, you know, get slightly inverted like that, where the upside there is an upside slope to calls. It doesn't happen often. Uh, it's a screaming sale when it's like that. Um, most of the time it's very sloping down. It gets actually very cheap. Um, so that's stuff we look at at an option pit sometime from time to time, depending on uh, the level. But, um, I think overall though you have it, but you, it's mostly when you talk about skew, it has to be skew in context of what is the underlying product is it an index, a commodity, um, or is it the VIX? Um, uh, it just depends on what the, the class of options as you're talking about. Most equities pretty much trade similarly, except again for what I mentioned, Apple and a few others. And Facebook now, as they've actually, that skews inverted on the upside. It used to trade at a screaming discount. It no longer does that. Yeah, one thing to add on that with Apple, the, the good old days as you put them, uh, when Apple had the the skew the way with which it was, it was very fun times for collaring, so to speak, and that what would happen is that you could get more 
and it wouldn't always work out exactly this way, but a lot of times you could get a very favorable collar with more juice on the call side and it wouldn't cost quite as much on the put side. And to a point that still does exist in the in gold and silver, not like it not quite as much as I would like, quite frankly. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, that's something to where if you're going to collar the commodities, meaning you buy oil or and, or anything with that, the skew with the calls being priced greater than the puts, it's something that can be of benefit to you if you are bullish on such things. Yeah, for a diehard collar like you, Mr. Tusa, that's certainly, yeah. those are good times, those, uh, those bid up upside skew. Of course, Great, great comments from Mr. Andrew and Uncle Mike. Of course, uh, just add, I'd say, if you see an inverted skew in something like a $3 biotech, <laughs> tread lightly. You yes. don't want, <laughs> you don't want to be... it will go up $20. Exactly. You don't <laughs> want to be net short units, a one by seven ratio when that thing goes up 20 handles. Uh, so definitely perhaps have some go the old uh, back spread as opposed to the front spread going back to the earlier question in that sense. Be net long some units in your back pocket if you are going to take advantage of that distortion because when you see them in those little names, that's when things get really, really crazy, but also potentially fun. All right, great questions. That's about all the time we have for the old mail block today, and now we're going to keep on rolling right on into our final segment, Around the Block. Around the Block. All right, if you've been listening for a while, you know what those car horns mean. They mean it is time for our final segment where we look ahead to what we're watching for the rest of this week. Mr. Alex, we'll start with you. I know what you're watching. Lulu earnings coming out on the 12th. That's probably your uh, your big focal point right now. And, of course, Apple tomorrow. Uh, you took the words out of my mouth. Uh, yeah, everybody will be looking at Apple tomorrow. Uh, Lulu on the 12th. Um, the 10-year has bounced off three, and we're all still here and still breathing so uh that's good but still looking at the 10 year uh and we're keeping an eye on washington the 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 crowd is coming back and uh we'll see how they can resolve some of this stuff um and we're watching the mideast uh macro events but washington is back and this is going to be a very interesting month uh, to see if they can uh, get their house in order out there and what it will mean to debt ceiling and eventually who the new head of the Fed is. Of course, the cynics among us would say Washington coming back is a definite contrarian indicator. But uh, say la vie, I'll leave that for another show, perhaps our pundit, our Washington pundit show. <laughs> All right, Mr. Andrew, what are you watching for the rest of this week, sir? Oh, uh, yeah, you know, more Syria, um... Apple will see tomorrow how vol comes in. I'm curious to see how if we can get volatility and kind of crap out a little bit. And if not, in fact, we kind of had this uh, this Syria relief rally today uh, with the news between uh, the Russians changing kind of their tune on how they're involved. I don't know what possessed them to have the uh, change of mind uh, to help uh, the Syrians uh, uh uh, let's just say, uh, relieve them of their weapons of mass destruction. Um, but, you know, I think the market took that as a positive. I think that was a big part of the rally today. And, of course, like Alex said, we always have Congress coming back into town to screw everything up and possibly jack the volatility back up again as we all wait for them to decide what to do. Yes, Apple pricing in a nice, uh, looks like a nice 17 or so point rally tomorrow, or not rally, a nice 17 or so point move uh, in this event tomorrow. So it'll be interesting to see by the time you listen to this, listeners, you might have a better handle on whether or not that is that is accurate or as perhaps Andrew thought, a little bit too rich. Either way, that vol is going to come out tomorrow unless we see something. This this really is just an atrocious phone. <laughs> no one really wants to touch it. <laughs> That's a different story for another day. the same but bigger. Yeah. Look, it, it, <laughs> or we, smaller. The screen no longer works. You can't use it that anymore. <laughs> then, then you might see it break the 400 handle. We'll see. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mike, talking about Apple, what is your big focus? Obviously, Apple... Uh, what else you got going on on the old tape for tomorrow? Well, I'm curious to see, just obviously with Syria, um, why the metals didn't move that much today. That's surprising, and I'm just kind of curious to see if we get a delayed blitz, so to speak. And then also on the subject of blitzing, obviously my the first time I've ever made a guaranteed prediction on this show, it did not come true, but those stinking Patriots got a last-second field goal on the on Buffalo, but... Maybe next week, boys. We'll get it done. That's what you get for getting away from your 45% guarantee. 
Oh, I give a 50% guarantee. <laughs> Come on now. I give, you, I give you a little bit of wiggle room in there just in case. Yeah. <laughs> did, did he, what did he say, football? Yes. Is that, are they, are they starting that yet? It's that time, sir. <laughs> There's no teams up in Maine, but uh, yes, it does happen every now and then. Around this time of year or so. <laughs> Who has you... all Sunday to watch football? My gosh, they must not. What do you do? Just watch TV and drink beer all day? Sounds great. You're forgetting the wings. <laughs> You're forgetting the wings, a very important part of the equation. <laughs> all right. And on that note, we're going to bring to a close this episode of the Option Block. It was great to have the whole gang back on the show. And starting off with you, Mr. Andrew, what is coming up in the land of the pit? I actually know what we're doing for once. Wow, it's like you've been on this show before or something. It's amazing oh, oh, how that works. Uh, we have a new Trends in the VIX with uh, Mark and Russell Rhodes of the CBOE, uh, writer of a very nice book on the VIX, by the way, uh, VIX Derivatives, uh, which I recommend. I actually read it. I don't read too many uh, option-related books, um, but that was a pretty good one. Good introductory book. Uh, that is the 28th of September. Uh, from nine to five, it costs some bucks, but I'm sure if you call up Mark, uh, and if you, uh, sign up for the event, we will get you some kind of deal on other goodies from option pit, mostly our educational services, but for what you'd spend on the event and what people probably waste trading the VIX their first year, uh, it's definitely worth going to the event and learning how it works first before you take your hard earned shekels and chuck them out the window at a fine establishment like um, Options Express or something like that. Learn how the product works first, then think about how you might want to go about uh, trading it. So Heresy, it sir. lots of weird little things that goes on with it. Best to learn it from, uh, you know, professionals. I think you have that backwards. You blast out some puts first, and then you kind of see how that goes, and then maybe you learn about it after exactly that's the process you would be surprised how many people we get well i did this <laughs> thing and it worked and it worked and it worked and then it didn't i think we get iron... that we get people at the ad didn't yeah point usually those people who had been doing iron condors for all these years because the newsletter said to do it and then suddenly it no longer works so good <laughs> all right thank you for that mr andrew and now uncle mike tusa what is coming up on the old rcm webinar train well tonight or I'm sorry, not tonight. This week, uh, we'll be having a Wednesday night webinar instead of a Thursday night webinar. Jerry Woolert from the Rebound Rabbits, he's going to come talk to us about how he trades in the stock world. We're excited to have him back. We have him on probably about once every three or four months, and uh, we will have Jerry this Wednesday. We're excited. I don't know what the stock thing is that you talk about. People tell me I should have a show about that one of these days, but I'm not really sure what you're talking about, so I'll have to learn first. It's a new thing, you know, stocks. I, I, I hear that they're getting pretty big in New York. Yeah, they're big with the kids these days, those stock things. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you for that, Uncle Mike. All right, and Mr. Alex, what is cooking in the land of OX education? There is a uh, full schedule of webinars. Uh, <coughs> our next live event is uh, September 21st in uh, Boston. Tomorrow after the close, I don't know if it'll be up before the show posts, but we're doing Idea Hub and Walk Limit after the close. And just to showcase one other one on Wednesday, Joe Cusack is going to do covered writing in IRA accounts. Uh, always a popular topic and always a popular strategy in IRAs. But all the events are free. Uh, they're available to uh, both customers and just anyone else who wants to come, just go to optionsexpress.com, click on the event tab, and you'll see an a entire selection, a full library of education uh, resources. Sounds good. Thank you for that, Mr. Viceroy. And that is going to do it for the show. Of course, if you'd like to check out archived episodes of this or any other program on the old Options Insider Radio Network, then surf on over to theoptionsinsider.com. Or, of course, you can find us on iTunes. Just search for Options Insider Radio Network, or even Options Insider should do it. You can find us on Stitcher, any place you like to find your podcast. We should be up there. If we're not, let us know. We'll put it up there and make sure you can get it. Of course, you can use the RSS feeds, or you can download it, hopefully soon, in our forthcoming mobile app. We'll let you know when that is live. We're going through all the final approval processes now. Hopefully, in the next few weeks, you should be able to use that as well. So, a lot of great ways to find us here and keep in touch with the old show. And on behalf of Alex 
and Andrew and Uncle Mike and, of course, myself. I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing to this program and making it such a success. And we'll see you next time right here on The Option Block. Become a part of The Option Block. Just visit www.theoptionsinsider.com slash forum to post a question for the hosts. You can also submit questions to twitter.com slash option block or leave a voicemail at 312-544-9356. Make it interesting and your question just might make it on the air. The Options Block is property of the Options Insider Incorporated. All rights reserved. of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com/radio or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes.